Israel defense shot down 99% of everything that was thrown at it. And no one died. Think about scores of these massive missiles flying in at ballistic speed, carrying huge warheads, and no one died. That's called a miracle. Uh, listen, w with the help of the U.S. military and, and other nations, most of the missiles and drones were shot down before even entering Israeli airspace. And talk about a miracle. Many of the missiles never even left their launch pads. They were duds from the get-go. And yet, we know that Iran has highly trained missile experts of their own, plus help from Russian, Chinese, and North Korean experts. There should be no way that their missiles could fizzle on their launch platforms, but large numbers of them did. The Simon Wiesenthal Center's Rabbi Yitchcock Adlerstein said, we are all witnesses to nothing short of a miracle of biblical proportions. Welcome to this edition of the Tom Hughes Report. On today's program, we're going to look at a miracle of biblical proportions. It's something a professor from Oxford University called a statistical impossibility. And it happened just a few days ago with the whole world watching. When it comes to Israel, Bible prophecy makes a couple of things clear. First, uh, the seven years of tribulation, known elsewhere in Scripture as the time of Jacob's trouble or the 70th week of Daniel, begins when Israel confirms a covenant with Antichrist. That means Israel must exist at that time. Uh, not a big surprise to us since it exists now. But to people a few hundred years ago, it seemed impossible. It also means that once Israel's final regathering has started, listen, nothing will stop it. Absolutely nothing will stop it. Another thing the Bible makes clear is that up to and including the early part of the tribulation period, Israel will continue to be prosperous. Their prosperity will be the major cause of the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war with Russia, Iran, uh, Turkey, and other members of that future coalition as they feel jealous of Israel's wealth and covet it for themselves. Uh, these prophecies and many others tell us that Israel will continue to exist and continue to prosper. Uh, knowing this has made it kind of fun to watch Israel through the years, like reading a mystery when you know the solution, but you don't know how the solution will be arrived at. Jews being regathered in the land was impossible until it happened. Creating a reborn Israel in a single day was impossible and then it happened. Facing the might of all Arab armies could not be possible until Israel successfully fought back each of their attacks over several decades. And folks, I want to encourage you, let these things sink in. We are watching something that is absolutely amazing, fun to watch if you're on the right side, and it's truly amazing to be alive in these days. But of those attacks, the one with the greatest technological sophistication and the greatest levels of explosive power at a single stroke took place last month when Iran attacked Israel with, get this, 170 drones, over 30 cruise missiles, and more than 120 ballistic missiles. A couple of weeks ago on this program, I suggested two possibilities. Either Iran intentionally botched its attack on Israel or the whole thing was a miracle. Since saying that, I've looked more carefully at the evidence and I no longer have any question on the matter. Iran did not intentionally make its military the laughingstock of the world. Close examination shows that Iran was trying to smash Israel in one mighty blow. Iran did not intentionally make itself look perplexed, inept, and impotent. 
Like the Midianites of Gideon's day, God defeated Iran and he did it before our very eyes. In other words, we just witnessed a miracle of the first order and a look at the facts makes it obvious. Uh, consider this, these words from retired U.S. Army General Barry McCaffrey. He said this on MSNBC's The 11th Hour with Stephanie Rule. And here's the quote. Uh, Many of the pundits we're hearing on the air say, well, the Iranians didn't want to hurt anybody. Uh, This was a tit for tat attack. That is utter nonsense, he said. That was 120 ballistic missiles with enormous warheads with a 12-minute flying time from Iran to Israel. It should have caused considerable damage. However, it didn't. To the astonishment of even those who've watched with great admiration the multi-layered air defense that Israel has put together. Intelligence sources say that an attack with 120 ballistic missiles represents the maximum number of missiles Iran can launch at one time. They have a huge inventory of missiles, but a limited number of missile launchers. They are mobile launchers, so they are difficult to find and put out of action. But there are only about 120 of them. In other words, think of this. In other words, the Iranian military hit Israel as hard as it could. The number of ballistic missiles alone should have been enough to overwhelm Israel's defenses. But just to make sure they overwhelmed those defenses, Iran also sent cruise missiles and a massive wave of drones. Iranian generals have been planning this for years. They knew that if they mounted a major attack on Israel, it had to cripple Israel with the first blow or they would receive a regime ending retaliatory strike. So they wanted to make that first blow a doozy. Uh, The BBC's James Landale wrote that the event was a small technological failure away from triggering a devastating international conflict. He pointed out that the Iranian attack was probably the largest combined missile and drone assault, get this, ever. Not only was Israel not crippled, it wasn't even harmed. A few days later, Israel responded with what amounted to a small tweak of the Iranian nose. Uh, They sent only a few missiles and apparently all of them made it through one of Iran's most highly defensed areas. This tweak on the nose reminded Iran of its vulnerability to Israeli forces. But Israel intentionally kept the attack small so as not to provoke a war or lose U.S. support. Israel didn't need to create a mass casualty event in Iran because Iran did little damage and killed no one in Israel. Even though it attacked Israel using as much might as it possibly could muster in a single blow. Folks, that's a miracle. And let me explain why. Israel's missile defense, even under optimal conditions, is expected to stop about 90% of what's thrown at it. But in this case, it stopped 99%. Shooting a missile out of the air is like hitting a bullet with a bullet. It's always difficult and never routine. Uh, When the other side hits you all at once with large amounts of ballistic and cruise missiles, as well as drones, the intercept rate should fall far below 90%. In fact, it should probably break down entirely, but it didn't. Israel defense shot down 99% of everything that was thrown at it, and no one died. Think about scores of these massive missiles flying in at ballistic speed, carrying huge warheads, and no one died. That's called a miracle. Uh, Listen, with the help of the U.S. military and, and other nations, most of the missiles and drones were shot down before even entering Israeli airspace. And talk about a miracle. Many of the missiles never even left their launch pads. They were duds from the get-go. 
And yet, we know that Iran has highly trained missile experts of their own, plus help from Russian, Chinese, and North Korean experts. There should be no way that their missiles could fizzle on their launch platforms, but large numbers of them did. The Simon Wiesenthal Center's Rabbi Yitchcock Adlerstein said, we are all witnesses to nothing short of a miracle of biblical proportions. Well, we could read what he says and say he's a religious leader. Uh, he's supposed to say that. Uh, so in that case, what does a scientist say? Well, let's look at that. Dr. Maximilian Abdebal is a renowned astrophysicist at Oxford University, and this is his wheelhouse. He specializes in defense systems. He said, on a scientific level, it simply cannot happen. Statistically, I know I am stating the obvious, but to be clear, if something cannot happen, statistically, yet it still happens, we're left with only one conclusion. This is a miracle. Folks, this is incredible. Uh, the renowned physics and defense expert also said even a 90% rate of protection would have been a miracle. Remember, if the missiles are coming in a single file, you expect a 90% success rate in shooting them down. He says that 90% would be a miracle if in this situation because these all came in at once. He added, if this is not an act of God, then I no longer know what a miracle is. It is greater than the victory of the Six-Day War or the War of Independence. Those wars can also be explained through natural events. But the rescue that took place for the people of Israel on Mosai Shabbat is simply impossible naturally. After studying Iran's military capabilities and what Iran threw into their massive attack on Israel, my eyes began to blink and my jaw began to drop. Put the ice cream back in the freezer. Naturalistic explanations do not suffice. We just saw one of the most stunning miracles in all of history. Earlier, I mentioned Ezekiel 38. In the last few weeks, the alliances between Russia, Turkey, and Iran have all grown stronger. Ezekiel indicates that those nations, along with some other smaller ones, will someday form a massive invasion force intent on attacking Israel in a bid to steal her wealth. One of the most fascinating aspects of this whole thing is that those nations have been traditionally enemies. Only in the last few years have they become allies. On April 22nd, an Israel Today headline said, concern and disappointment in Israel over the strengthening Russia-Iran ties. Uh, the sub-headline said, Moscow failed to condemn Iran's unprecedented aerial assault on Israel, thus abandoning its stated commitment to Israel's security. In other words, the ties between these nations are growing, and so is their enmity with Israel. There's talk of a new axis of evil in the world, but one of the axis nations is not mentioned in Ezekiel 38. That's China. Until recently, China and Russia have been traditional enemies. But when the West heavily sanctioned Russia, China propped them up. China claims that it has not supplied Russia with weapons, but it is widely known that China provides the electronics, the tools, and other basic supplies needed for Russia to replenish its various arsenals. They also provide something for which Russia is especially desperate. And guess what that is? It's money. They buy Russian gas. That keeps the Russian economy going, and in that way, funds Russia's part in its war with Ukraine and the West. And China has also befriended Iran and made itself an enemy to Israel. However, while these things are true regarding China, it's well worth noting that China began to separate itself from the Gog-Magog coalition. 
China apparently felt deceived by Russia after Vladimir Putin talked them into signing a partnership agreement without telling them that he was about to invade Ukraine. They saw it in their strategic interest to keep the West occupied with Russia, so they kept Russia going, uh, but they didn't like it. And now the Chinese are bringing up old grievances with Russia regarding land that Russia stole from them a hundred years ago. They want that land back. And with Russia so dependent on them, the Chinese believe this may be the time to strike. And it looks like they are going after even more than that. But continuing from there, the Bible also indicates that nations or kings from the East, which likely includes China, uh, will be part of the end time convergence of the nations at the Battle of Armageddon. But it does not mention China as part of the Ezekiel 38 coalition. And that fits with what's happening right now. There will be changes in these alliances as time goes by. But it's interesting that at the moment, the most important nations of the Ezekiel 38 war have made strategic alliances, drawing them closer than ever. At Hope For Our Times, our mission is to spread the hope of Jesus Christ through the Word of God. Your generous contributions enable us to create impactful videos and resources that offer hope during uncertain times. We invite you to partner with us in our mission. If you feel called to support us, please visit our website at hopeforourtimes.com where you'll find various ways to contribute financially. Additionally, donations can be sent by mail to Hope For Our Times, 1281 North State Street, Suite A, 311, San Jacinto, California, 92583. Your partnership directly fuels our efforts to develop new resources and connect with a wider audience. By partnering with us, you become an integral part of our mission to share the hope of Jesus Christ with a world in need. Now, let's return to the Tom Hughes Report. One of the more obvious features of end times Bible prophecy is the presence of a regathered nation of Israel. Countless prophecies demand that Israel must exist in the end time and that God himself will bring the people home. It is a major theme of the Old Testament and a promise renewed in the New Testament. Uh, today, there's a mass movement of Jewish individuals and families relocating to Israel. In the coming weeks and months, that movement will certainly grow. Increasing numbers of Jews no longer feel safe in their present communities. I think of places just like Los Angeles, which I'm not too far from. If I was a Jewish man walking through some of the streets of Los Angeles, I'd be very concerned about wearing my kippah and walking down the street identifying myself as a Jew. And I know that that story is repeated throughout the entire Western world. Even in places where they have lived for many generations, they suddenly feel like outsiders. The Jews return to the land and Israel's rebirth as a nation are completely unprecedented in world history. It is a miracle of such vast proportions that it makes the parting of the Red Sea seem small. The great Bible prophecy teacher, Dr. David R. Reagan, founder of Lamb and Lion Ministry, spoke at one of our Hope for Our Times prophecy conferences. And during an interview backstage, he said, and this is a quote from him, the most prolific prophecy in the Hebrew scriptures is that in the end times, God is going to regather his people from the four corners of the earth in unbelief. And that is going on right now. It is so important that Jeremiah, two times in identical language, says that when history is over and done and the Jewish people look back on their history, they will no longer swear by the God who delivered them from the Egyptian captivity, but they will swear instead by the God who regathered them from the four corners of the earth. Now it's the same God, but what that means 
is that when we look back on history, they will consider what was going on right now a greater miracle than the deliverance from Egyptian captivity. And the average Christian has no concept of its importance and significance. That's an incredible statement and an absolutely amazing truth. But most churches choose to ignore the greatest miracle since the resurrection, a miracle happening right now before our eyes. Christians around the world should be pointing to it as a testimony to the reality of God and truth of the scriptures. But in this dark time, too many church leaders have decided to explain away the Bible instead of rightly dividing the word of truth. These are difficult days for Jews. Anti-Semitism has been a worldwide phenomenon for millennia. But after the ugly eruption of it in Nazi Germany, many felt that it had peaked and would die away in shame. That was especially true in the United States. Anti-Semitism had been a big deal here up until Americans saw it as at its worst in World War II. It still existed after the war, but most thought it was dying away. Then almost 80 years later, October 2023, Hamas attacked Israel. It was one of the most shameful acts of aggression in world history. It was filled with murder, mutilation of women and babies, rape and other tortures. Almost immediately, demonstrations erupted on American college campuses. But the demonstrations did not condemn the murders or the rapes. They did not condemn the taking of civilian hostages, nor ask for their release. Instead, they blamed the whole thing on Israel, saying that the Jews in Israel were colonizers. In fact, many are even saying it never even happened. It's appalling. Protesters carry signs with words. The final solution, evoking memories of Hitler's final solution for the Jewish question. His solution was to simply murder the Jews. At Columbia University in New York, pro-Hamas protesters responded to pro-Israel counter-protesters by screaming, go back to Poland. I believe what we are witnessing now is the greatest threat to the Jews in the history of the world. You might say, well, wait a minute, what about Nazi Germany? What makes this greater? Here's, here's the thing. In the days of Nazi Germany, that threat to the Jews was localized to the German influence. What is happening right now, it's much broader. It is throughout the Western world and even whole nations are threatening Israel, such as we've already talked about Russia, China, Iran, and Turkey. Folks, we are in a place and we are watching the rise of anti-Semitism at an alarming rate, like birth pangs that come upon a pregnant woman, just as the Bible describes. And again, these people on college campuses saying, go back to Poland. Well, what does that mean? Well, this is really interesting because one weird thing is that Poland is not the indigenous home to the Jewish people. When the Jewish people were pushed out of their homeland, they dispersed to various areas of the world. Because of persecution and pogroms, they were then pushed out of other countries where they had gone. Uh, quite a few, though, by no means all, wound up in Poland. So what happened with Poland? Poland became the place that they relocated to, but it was not their indigenous land. They weren't, it wasn't their homeland. What happened to them when in Poland in 1939, 3.3 million Jews lived in Poland. Then came the Nazis. And by the end of the war, only 380,000 Jews remained alive in that country. The protesters are not just saying leave. They are saying go back to a place where almost, think of this, 90% of your people wound up in Nazi ovens or in mass graves. They seem to believe that colonizers should go home, that they shouldn't stay in America. 
They say this land belongs solely to the Native Americans. But the protesters are not telling people of Irish or French descent to go home. They're saying it to the Jews and only to the Jews. In reality, the Jews have only one home. And they are not the colonizers. Israel is the ancient land of their fathers. It is in Israel that they trace their ancestry back 4,000 years. If they can't live there, where are they supposed to live? But that's really the point, isn't it? To hardcore anti-Semites, Jews are simply not supposed to live. Uh, that's why they chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That's why they chant about Hitler being right, about using gas chambers again, and saying openly that Zionists don't deserve to live. The ancient hatred is back at full force. Folks, I look at what's going on with Israel right now. This attack against the nation of Israel, against the people in the geographical location of Israel, and the attack against the Jews as individuals themselves. And it leads me only to the Bible and what is coming, what the Bible describes in its words of Bible prophecy, not just for the nation of Israel, but for the whole world. Listen, everything is happening exactly as the Bible says it is going to happen. It is proof that the Bible is true. It is proof that you can trust the Bible. And what the Bible also tells us is that there is hope in no other name than that of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the prophecies of the first coming of Christ are all true. They were all fulfilled exactly as the Bible says. And as we are watching everything converge, just as the Bible says, especially with Israel as the epicenter, we know that the Bible is true, that in Jesus only do we have the hope of eternal life. Listen, understand this, that Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Only in Christ can you have the hope of forgiveness and the hope of salvation. Listen, have you trusted Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? If you have not, then the Bible tells us that we will be judged for our sins. Listen, you don't want that to happen. I implore you, ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. He himself said he will in no way cast out anybody who comes to him. Jesus alone is the hope of salvation. God bless. Thank you for tuning into the Tom Hughes Report. We pray today's program was a blessing to you. Here at Hope For Our Times, our purpose is to guide individuals towards the hope that can be only found in a personal relationship with Jesus. We encourage you to explore our website at hopeforourtimes.com and reach out to us through the contact page. We value your feedback and would love to hear from you. A special thank you to His Channel for graciously allowing us to utilize their wonderful studios for the recording of the Tom Hughes Report. Don't forget to explore their website at hischannel.com for an array of Christ-centered programs. Make sure to join us again next week for another insightful episode of the Tom Hughes Report. And always remember to look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near.